Good morning. Uh, <laughs> okay, so let's start off. This is the second time I've actually tried to make this video. I was out on the first day of spring and what a beautiful day it was, but I was using a brand new camera to me, my new action camera. I'll leave that to another video. Uh, I recorded everything. It looked great on the camera and then I got it home and discovered that my editing, my video editing program wouldn't handle the files that this camera produces. Frustrating to say the least. So I do have to get another uh, video editing program, which I'll do of course. It's, you know, you can get reasonably good ones for not too much money without going to the professional level ones, which takes a lot of time to learn all the ways of using it. Okay, so that day was beautiful. First day of spring. On that day, they were predicting a heavy snowfall for today. Uh, that's Nova Scotia in the spring. It could have happened. Now apparently it's not going to be snow, but it's going to be heavy rains. So I came out early this morning to get ahead of the rain. And by the look of the sky, I'm not going to get too far ahead of it at all. And uh, it's much colder than I thought it was going to be. Right now we're about minus four degrees Celsius. Uh, I think I'm dressed well enough, but my hands are cold. And I know part of that is the damp air. That happens on the East Coast or any coastal areas as well. Uh, you just feel it's a damp cold, as we often call it, and it penetrates. It truly does. So uh, I'm going to get moving very quickly, see if I can build up a little warmth. I am making coffee today, and that's actually the only focus of this video, is the coffee itself, because this is different, different enough from anything I've made before that I thought it was worth sharing with you. And it came from one of my viewers, the suggestion for making this. So that's what I want to do. I want to share this way of making coffee with you. And that's what we're going to do. So um, I may keep the videos along the way a little less just so I can get to my location, get something going to make the, the coffee with, and then we'll pick you up. But I'll see if there's anything worth I can, you know, get you a couple of videos along the way at least. All right, let's keep moving. Well, here is a fortunate find. What a treat. Wild coffee beans. Wild Nova Scotia coffee beans. The best that I have ever tasted. Wow. Okay, I'm going to have to collect some of these up and I'll make my coffee with them today. Question of the day. Tell me what that is. There's a smaller version here. I'll tell you, when I was a young child, I used to think it was a nest that crows would make in the trees. What do we got here? This is a fir tree that they're in. But it's not a nest, but it looks like one. Tell me what it is. All right, I've got my water, got my stove set up. Got some birch bark, lots of birch bark, little spruce twigs, a little bit of fine birch bark. I'll show you what I'm, how I'm going to use this in a second. Actually, I don't have my stove completely set up. This is the feed ramp. There, that's better. All right, so I'm going to cheat. Well, okay, not cheat. I'm going to use a different methodology. It's perfectly legitimate. I have some fat wood. I don't use it often, don't usually need to, but it's nice to use once in a while because fatwood is one of those just wonders of nature. Often referred to as nature's napalm. This is just so volatile. Now, this is not my primary fire starter. The birch bark is going to be my primary fire starter, but this is just going to catch the spark so I can get the rest of the birch bark lit more easily. I haven't used this for a while. 
Yep, that's good. Like that. Put those little tiny, did I put it out? I did. Too much of a rush mark. Let's do it again. That's better. Take your time. Now I can drop that in. Another couple of pieces of birch bark on top. This old dried up. You can hear it, right? Listen to that. That's how old and dried up it is. That's going to be enough. I don't have to get carried away here. Put my spruce twigs in. Put the knife away before I don't. I'm going to be a bit smoky, a bit flamey for a second between the spruce twigs and the birch bark and the fat wood. And what do I have here? A little bit of maple, just dried maple twigs. It's my initial fuel. Still in the kindling phase, really. Oh, sticks everywhere now. This stove has great graft, eh? Maybe I'll try switch over to something else here. Oh, this is really dead. All right, now on top of that, I have these little splits that have been here since last fall. They had a fire in a stove last fall. They've sat here all winter. Nothing wrong with these. These are still good, hard, and dry. At least they feel dry. overload the stove. I've made that mistake before. One more. All right, that looks like it's set up pretty good. All right. Do I need my gloves? Don't think I can still get this on. There. No, not quite. There we go. That's better. All right. Kettle on. A little bit of smoke. Of course, the fire's not super established yet, but not too bad. One of the things I look for when I'm testing a stove, of course, is just how much a pot will dampen down the airflow and create smoke. And this one is, see what happens if I lift it off. Nice clean underneath. You know what it is? A lot of that is the tires, and you can see it on the pot. But still, there is some smoke from it, no doubt about it. I think that'll probably lessen as it gets, the fire gets hotter. What am I looking for? A spoon? Lunch today, very simple, right? Hard to beat though. A couple of hard boiled eggs. It's going to take a little while. I put a lot of water in there. I wanted enough water to have for coffee after the fact. All right, that's all there is for a few minutes. But while they're cooking, I do have something I want to share with you. All right, the water is starting to heat up. The smoke is gone. I, I should have, actually I will. When I go back over, I'll show you. The smoke is gone. So I think part of the issue was, is I just didn't give the fire enough time to really establish. And there's still a lot of birch bark and spruce twigs in there, which, which of course burn smoky to start with. And the cold water in the pot meant that that smoke tend to condense a little bit, if you will, and that's why it was smoky. Now it's clean. Much more impressive now. Okay, what did I want to share with you? Well, it's not a review. Actually, it's not a review because I didn't buy it and it wasn't sent to me. It was a gift from my wife. It's a new blanket. Now this is special. 
This is made or produced for Parks Canada, our National Parks Service. So they have an online shop and proceeds from their online shop and they sell things like hats and uh, sweaters and hoodies and all the things that you would normally see as promo materials. But this was different and when my wife Gina picked up on this she asked if I would be interested in having it and I said you know that's cool I like that and so she bought it for me. It's made from older, recycled Parks Canada employee uniforms when they were still made from wool. And they're not now, they're all modern materials. But when they were still made from wool, they had all kinds of these uniforms left over in stock. And they sent them out for recycling into wool blankets, but combined them with fleece. So first off, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a look at it. And it's, uh, I'll put the dimensions and the links and everything down in the video description. But I just like it because it's different. Can you see Hopefully that's going to focus in on the Parks Canada logo there. 60 by 90, something like that in size. So, but I'll make sure that's, like I said, in the video description. It's a good size. It's not a huge blanket, but it's a nice size. Now, I'll give you a close-up of the materials. The wool, if I didn't see that written on the label, I would not think of this as wool. I don't know what I thought it would be, but it, it's got... Well, let me just show you the... Hopefully that's going to focus in on the material. It's just a nice, smooth wool material, but fleece on the other side. So it's kind of like two blankets in one. It uh, gives you what you would want for hanging around a fire, the wool protection of the wool so that the sparks don't create holes. It gives you the fleece, which is still warm and very fast drying. It gives you something very nice and luxurious. Uh, I wore it around the house for the first day that I had it, just strung over my shoulder and clipped with a, a clip in, in the center of it. But uh, I don't think it's getting cold here, but I don't think it's cold enough to wrap up in it. But it's just, and maybe I will. And okay, that's what I'll do. I'll demonstrate this by wrapping up in it. All right, let's see if I can model this for you. Yeah, something like that now. I apologize if I end up covering... Let's see if I'll roll the microphone right to the outside here so I don't muffle it. I actually brought something out that I can use to wear it with. I've shown this in another video. It's a pair of suspender clips, the clip-on suspender alligator teeth type things. I have a video on using that with wool blankets if you're interested. What it does is it allows me to grab onto the blanket. A little uneven, but... You get the basic concept. Now I can wrap up, sit in my hammock chair there, and just enjoy the warmth, or sit around a campfire if I'm out camping. That's probably what I'll do with this, is take a car camping with me to a national park, of course. I'm gonna give you another color. Now, on the website, it looked a little bit more green. Now it looks a little blue-green, but still very acceptable for use out here in the woods. Just a nice, lightweight, wool and fleece combination blanket. Yeah, thank you, Gina. I love this. Thank you. All right, my eggs are ready, but I just wanted you to see the fact that, uh, let's have a look. Oh yeah, boiling hard. Smoke is gone. That's just steam that you're seeing now. So obviously I didn't leave the fire established itself well enough the first time, but it's working well now. So these eggs are going to be really, really hot. So I'll put them in my bowl, let them cool off for a little while. But, yep, I can do that. Put that back on the fire with sticky leaves on the bottom. So here's something I really like about this stove is that I can feed longer sticks in, any length sticks in really, to keep the fire going. Another one, feed that one in. Because of the feed ramp, these are really quite long. All right, I decided to go ahead and have my lunch off camera for a reason. Uh, we're supposed to be getting rain in the next half hour or so, but the temperature's dropping dramatically here. I think we're gonna get snow instead, and I just wanna get to making coffee before I have to pack up in a hurry and leave. All right, so <laughs> before I begin, I want to make my apologies to my Norwegian viewers because there's likely a good chance that I'll slaughter the pronunciation of this. We're going to be making kokafe, and I know it's in the title, and I'm hoping I'm close to the right pronunciation, kokafe.
And Cool Café, interpreted into English, is basically boiled coffee. Does that sound an awful lot like cowboy coffee to you? Well, it is. It's very close. But there is a twist that the Norwegian people put on this that I'll share with you today. And I'll, I've tried this, and it does work. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so I did a little bit of... Oh, first off, I better give credit to where credit is due. Uh, Ken Dexter, one of my viewers, suggested this to me at the end of one of my other videos. I appreciate it, Ken. This has been a great idea, great suggestion. And if anybody else has suggestions for making coffee out here in the woods, throw them at me. If I can pull them off and make them work, I'll give it a try. All right, now back to Co-Cafe. So I started doing some background research into what Co-Cafe was. I found that there is some very old traditional methods and there's some very modern methods. So to start with, Co-Cafe means boiled coffee. Turk Cafe means hiking coffee. So if you're out on a hike, I guess technically you could say today I'm having Turk Cafe rather than Co-Cafe. But there has been a modern resurgence of this, and now it's become very popular in the upscale restaurants in Norway, where they'll actually make your coffee right at your dining table. And let's see if I get this one. Coca Cafe. Coca Cafe. And the difference is, is rather than boiling the coffee, they steep the coffee. And to me, that sounds more like camp coffee, the way I like to make it myself. So Coca Cafe is steeped coffee. Now, somebody correct me if I've got the interpretation of that incorrect. Uh, it's become so popular that there is a kettle specifically designed for doing this in the restaurants, or you can purchase it and do it at home. In fact, I'll put the name on the screen and uh, see if I can't find a picture to put on the screen as well. Otherwise, I'll just put it in the link below. Um, it just looks like a red regular kettle, but I think it's, it's designed so that you can pour the coffee out without the grounds going with it, which, of course, there are tricks for doing out here in the woods as well. So that's Coca Cafe. So we have Coca Cafe, traditional Norwegian coffee, Coca Cafe, uh, modern interpretation of that coffee, and Turk Cafe, which is the hiking coffee. So <coughs> I went looking and I found some interest. What I wanted to know is, how was it made? What's the recipe? What tricks and tips could I share with you on it? So here, here's some of the things I found. Um, to start with, how much coffee? How much coffee are you going to put in your water? Well, the modern recipe calls for 70 grams of coffee per liter of water. And that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, I'm going to use two cups of water, so half a liter. And that's 500 grams of water. So I'm going to be putting in 35 grams of coffee. Now, the choice of coffee is important. It, traditionally, it is a light roast coffee, coarsely ground. And the reason it's light roast and coarsely ground is this. Light roast coffees are less affected by the extreme heats of boiling. They don't turn as bitter as much as quickly. The coarser ground coffee is also more resistant to turning bitter as well. So that's why those two choices. Now, I don't have traditional coffee from Norway, but I think I have something that in my mind, is just as good and maybe even better. And, of course, I'm going to be using my Rampage coffee, which is a medium roast. I have ground it, kind of coarse, as you'll see in a minute, so I'll give you an idea just how coarse it is, at least the way I'm going to be making it today. All right, how much does the traditional recipes call for? Well, th this is kind of cute. In fact, I found it's fun. Put the water in your kettle and start scooping coffee into the water until it's thick enough that a lemming can run across the top without getting their feet wet. <laughs> I think that's kind of fun, right? So that's very descriptive. In other words, they put a lot of coffee in their water. So that's one way of doing it. Now, more traditional ways of doing it as well include if you bring your coffee to a boil, take it off of the boil, put it back on the boil. Do that two, three, up to five times before you take it off for the last time. Uh, you know, I found that references to that in different places. It's right across Scandinavia. It's made very much the same way. So that could be more of a localized thing than it is a Norwegian thing. But uh, those are just some of the things I found about it. Now, what makes the traditional Cafe different from cowboy coffee? It's what they put in it that makes it different. So the uh, Sami peoples of the northern Scandinavian areas use salted reindeer, and they put the salted reindeer meat in their coffee while it's boiling. Uh, I had never heard of anything like that. So I don't have access to salted reindeer meat, 
but what I do have access to is venison. So I sliced some venison up, heavily salted with sea salt, dried it out, and that's what I'm going to be putting in the coffee today. And I've tried this, and it does work. I think it works for a couple of reasons. Now, the original reasoning is is that the uh, reindeer meat and the salt added flavor to the coffee. Well, I don't doubt that it does. I can't really taste the meat flavor in the coffee, but salt has been known traditionally in cowboy coffee and in any number of cultures for taking some of the bitterness away in coffee. So I think it's legitimate to put salt in your coffee, if you're boiling it, that is. We're not going to be boiling it today, just to be clear. I'm going to be steeping it, and I'll, I'll demonstrate in a moment. Yeah, so it's really simple, trailside coffee made over a fire and adding rain, salted reindeer meat to it. How, what can go wrong? All right. I've got to get the fire stoked back up. We'll get the water hot again, and we'll make some cold cafe. All right, let's take a look. Rolling hard. Very good. Yeah, I can take that right off. That's hot. All right, I took the water off of the boil. Traditionalists would leave it on the boil, but I prefer to do it this way, so... I'm using my Rampage coffee, as mentioned. Maybe you can see how coarsely I've got it ground. It's like French press grind, but maybe a little coarser. Now, I know exactly how much coffee to add in terms of scoops. It's two, three, four, five, and a half. I measured it out or weighed it out ahead of time so that I would know ahead of time how much it would take. I'm going to take my spoon, give it a little stir. Now, some people say stir. Some people say don't stir. Just let it soak and then break the crust afterwards. Some people say scoop off any foam that you see after the fact. Uh, they're all true. I can see it soaking in as it goes. I'm just going to do it. Stir it now. Because my reasoning is I want that to settle down to the bottom before I pour it in my cup. So I get fewer grounds. Now, yes, there are some tricks, and I may do it as well, which is to put a little splash of cold water in on top of it. That'll help to take the grounds down. I've heard tapping on the side. Yeah, maybe. I think what that works, if there's a crust on top, it helps to break the crust and cause it to go down. But honestly, time. Time is as good as anything. How much time? Uh, four, five minutes. Don't let it get too cold, of course, but don't give, don't take it off too soon before you pour it. So I'm going to give it about five minutes, and uh, then we'll give it a try. Man, I almost forgot the secret ingredient. The reindeer, or in my case, venison. Salted venison. That's what I'm throwing in. Well salted venison. I have no idea how much. I've tried chewing on this. It is salty. You know what? I'm just going to put it all in. I don't have that much here, only an ounce or two. There. That'll teach me for forgetting. So that's all I'm going to do. Put the salt in it. You know, I'm going to actually put it on the heat without bringing it to a boil. Just let it stay warm on top of the heat. There's not enough heat there to bring it back to a rolling boil. Okay. Now we'll wait out there five minutes. All right, let's give this a try. Grab the coffee. Now, in order to have a traditional cup of coffee, Scandinavian style, you got to have a traditional cook. So this, uh, this is one I carved myself a few years ago from some spalted birch, well seasoned. Let's see what we get going here. Uh, maybe some ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit of ground, so I didn't leave it set quite long enough. All right, that should be enough for a taster. Let's see what we got. Well, definitely smells good. Oh my goodness. So the last couple of times I tried this to make it, I didn't put in quite that much salted venison in it. This time I put in what I had left and it has made a difference to the taste of the coffee. It is anything but bitter. It's not bitter at all. Uh, I would moderate the amount of salt you put in. I mean, it's just like making cowboy coffee. You can put salt in it, just don't put too much in it. I may have put a little bit much more in it this time than before, but it's still tasting really good. 
It does a really good job of smoothing out any bitterness caused by having it on the heat or having it in the water for too long. So easy to make, right? Clean up now, that's going to be something a little bit more challenging. Now, the kettle I'm using has a nice wide open top on it, so it won't be too hard to clean up with a spoon, but... Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Ken Dexter, thank you very much for suggesting Cool Cafe with salted reindeer. If you want to send me some, I'll make the video again with salted reindeer. No, just kidding. Don't. It's okay. Uh, I like the salted venison. I'd love to have reindeer meat someday, but uh, I'm not going to ask anybody to send me some. Oh, I am enjoying that. Oh, I got to pour a little bit more in here. I've got enough to refill my cup a few times. And there's not as many grounds as I thought were floating in. Actually, better that time even. I think the ones that floated in were the ones that didn't sink. Sometimes the larger grounds take a little longer to saturate and sink to the bottom. The, uh, oh yeah, that's better yet. And richer yet as well. Okay. All right, that was fun. I enjoyed doing that. I'll make that again. Maybe not with the reindeer meat, but I mean, it's camp coffee without the reindeer meat. Coke Cafe, Turk Cafe on the trail here. Coca Cafe because I steeped it rather than boiled it. Again, I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing the terms incorrectly. Uh, thank you. All right. If you have any comments or questions, please put those in the comments section below. If you have any suggestions for coffee that I can do out here in the woods, as I mentioned, if I can try it, if I can pull it off, I'll do it out here in the woods. The recipe and some of the information I shared with you, I'll put that in the video description if you're interested. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.